We're here with uh, Harry Campbell, senior scientist with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, he's based in Harrisburg. He's been with the foundation since 2004. Good morning, Harry. How are you doing this morning? Good. How are you, Dave? Good. Good. Say, so CBF put out a, one of their annual reports on the health, uh, the state of the Bay report uh, this week, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, what uh, what the results were and also what it means for Pennsylvania, sort of a little report card on how Pennsylvania is doing. Okay. Uh, I guess first off, can you give me a th sort of a thumbnail um, overview of what the state of the Bay report found overall? Yes. Well, this year's score for 2012 was a 32, and that's a one-point increase from our last State of the Bay report, which was released in 2010. Now, a 32 may not sound very good to a lot of folks because it's on a scale of 0 to 100. If I got a 32 on an exam, I'd be feeling pretty bad about myself. But quite frankly, as it pertains to the restoration of the Chesapeake Bay, that's a pretty darn good score. It's actually one of the, the best score we've had since we've actually started the Chesapeake Bay State of the Bay report. So what we are seeing is tentative but steady progress in the right direction. And in fact, since 2008, the score has gone up by 10%. So what we are seeing is tenuous but positive movement in the right directions. Well, I, that sounds good. Like I said, like you said, it's it's sort of hard to to judge scientifically how much progress we're making. And you have in the report, uh, I believe, thirteen different indicators that you look at. I think the report said five improved, seven stayed the same, and one declined. I guess out of those indicators, what do you think was the most significant one that improved as far as the bay and as far as Pennsylvania is concerned? Well, I think, you know, it's actually what hasn't necessarily changed much, and that is in regards to the loads of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment pollution, particularly coming from the Susquehanna River, which provides 50% of the freshwater to the Chesapeake Bay. So Pennsylvania plays an integral part in the overall health of the Chesapeake Bay. And with continued population growth, with a down, downward spiral of the economy in recent years, what we have seen actually is continued improvement, if not uh, dramatic improvement in certain key indicators like that of rockfish and crabs and oysters, which are essentially the canaries in the coal mine, the aquatic life that lives within the Chesapeake Bay that have started to really rebound despite the influences of Hurricane Sandy and other uh, hydrologic events, high precipitation events, high runoff events that have inundated the watershed in recent years. We're starting to see that our pollution reduction practices are not only taking root literally and figuratively, that they're starting to demonstrate real success in terms of load reductions and water quality improvement that is then being reflected back to us in a not only increased population of these key aquatic resources like crabs and oysters, which have also benefited from better management practices in terms of harvesting, but also these pollution reductions taking root and actually creating greater resiliency within the system to some of these perpetrations like Hurricane Sandy, which can inundate the watershed with high runoff, high sediment, high amounts of pollution. We see greater resiliency and the question now is, has the bay, many scientists are beginning to ask, has the bay reached a tipping point? Meaning the progression of improvement is now catching momentum, where each incremental BMP that we put in place not only improves the landscape on which it's applied, but has a cumulative effect, a catalyst effect within the bay itself. In terms of the uh, pollution uh, problems and Pennsylvania's contribution to the Bay pollution problems, um, what challenges specifically does Pennsylvania face in terms of reducing pollution loads? Um, obviously farms contribute, uh, stormwater runoff, wastewater plants. What particular challenges does Pennsylvania face in, in reducing its contribution to the, to the Bay pollution problem? Well, the good news about these challenges is that we're about halfway there. The bad news is we're halfway there. And now we have a deadline. 
We have a deadline of achieving the implementation of pollution reduction practices that scientists have estimated are necessary to achieve water quality standards in the Chesapeake Bay by 2025. So we have to get there by then. And the, practice, the, the challenges that we have today are literally the challenges that we've had in the past. But agriculture over the last several decades has made a significant reduction in the amount of pollution coming from the landscape, a 13 to 14 percent, or excuse me, 13 to 14 million pound reduction roughly over the course of the years. Uh, we've seen with the recent adoption in uh, 2006 of nutrient pollution discharge standards for sewage treatment plants. We're starting to see those coming into play and the reductions associated with sewage treatment plants in Pennsylvania starting to uh, be reduced. Where we have issues that still need to be uh, dealt with and the challenges are technologically and economically significant is with the legacy, if you will, of urban stormwater runoff in our older boroughs and communities, first and second ring suburbs, where there is little or no effective pollution reduction stormwater management other than the shuttling of stormwater runoff from our lawns, rooftops, streets, and parking lots into pipes that then discharge themselves into the nearest receiving water body with little or no interaction with the environment and little or, little or no ability for pollution to be reduced in that stormwater, let alone the volume of that stormwater to be reduced. So that challenge is the biggest challenge at this juncture that we have technologically and economically. But we have a plan and the plan is called the Chesapeake Bay Clean Water Blueprint and it has spurred planning initiatives for all the Bay States including Pennsylvania to develop what are known as watershed implementation plans. These plans are very specific in many regards. They give us a roadmap towards achieving not only local water quality improvement, but our obligations to the Chesapeake Bay as well. And if we implement those, if we continue to do what we've done and actually don't stop now, but reinvest in our initiatives, then we will achieve these, this implementation by 2025 and meet our obligations for the Chesapeake Bay as well as for the myriad of pollution and polluted streams that we have right here in our own backyard. So stormwater runoff from our older communities like Harrisburg, right where I am, where I live in New Cumberland, those areas it remains to be the, one of the biggest challenges we have. But we cannot ignore other sectors. We need to continue working in the agricultural sector. We need to see through uh, the implementation of pollution reduction technologies on our wastewater treatment plants and or the adoption, further adoption of nutrient trading to achieve those load reductions and really kind of uh, use every tool in our toolbox. But we have a plan and that plan, if we follow it, will lead to success. Well, implementing that plan is, is uh, always, always the rub and it requires resources. Uh, originally, a program called Growing Greener that was adopted in 1999 provided significant funding for watershed improvements, storm, um, stormwater con controls in, in uh, buffer, forested buffers along streams, lots of different projects that addressed the needs of the, of the bay and improving our own water quality here in Pennsylvania, first and foremost. Uh, but funding for the first time last year was increased uh, by the passage of the Marcel Shell drilling impact fee to, to some extent. Um, we've seen the Corbett administration restore funding to the REAP tax farm conservation tax credit program. Obviously we're sort of catching up from six or seven years of uh, continually uh, lower funding for these kinds of issues. Where do you think the challenges are going to be in the future in terms of getting resources to the to the municipalities, the farmers, and, and those people that need to make these improvements. Where do you think the challenges are going to be? <laughs> Boy, that's the, that's the million dollar question. If I had the answer for that, uh, I'd be, probably be governor or president. But, um, you know, quite frankly, you're absolutely right. Growing greener 
and I actually wasn't in the state when this was adopted in 1999, but it was a national example. And quite frankly, the Ridge administration uh, needs to be commended for uh, the, the adoption of Growing Greener, probably the most significant environmental effort that the state has undertaken. And, and when I, where I was in Michigan at the time, um, you know, they were considering something similar. And actually, when that was adopted, they used that and referred to that as the touchstone of a national standard that they thought that they should replicate and did ultimately replicate. And so, uh, you know, growing greener, we should be, as Pennsylvanians, proud of that legacy. And just for a little plug on, on growing greener, you know, we need to reinvest in that and make sure that growing greener, as it moves into its uh, new iterations and new, uh, new opportunities, is continued to be funded and, and prioritized within the state of Pennsylvania because it has been so successful at not only facilitating local water quality improvement, but also in helping us achieve our obligations to the Chesapeake Bay. So it is a fundamental program in Pennsylvania, and it would be a shame to allow that to wither on the vine, if you will. The challenges that we have today are that there are a lot of competing interests in terms of funding sources for different uh, opportunities, if you will, both environmentally and non-environmentally. And in today's economic environment, which appears to be improving, at least in the private sector, what we see, though, as is usually the case, a lag, if you will, in terms of tax, re tax revenues and the distribution of, of those revenues from the state or federal government to the local municipalities. But we also have the perpetual challenge that municipalities face in Pennsylvania, given our local governmental structure, in raising revenues sufficient to meet the myriad of different obligations and challenges that they have. And so what we need to do is start to begin to think about how we can create um, and facilitate more creative and innovative thinking as it pertains to opportunities to deal with the legacy of our urban infrastructure, our stormwater management, for instance, and the storm sewer systems that we have. So there are a myriad of examples from across the nation that folks have looked at, different types of examples like uh, stormwater authorities, in which as part of a, a either a county or even a, a, an individual local government or a watershed based sort of uh, type of system that they raise funds for the maintenance improvement and operation of their stormwater sewer systems just like we do for our sewer systems because quite frankly you know right now we don't have an explicit funding source if you will to maintain that particular piece of our infrastructure and to improve it to, uh, to 21st century standards in many cases like in Philadelphia and Harrisburg and other areas, that infrastructure is by and large decades, if not centuries old. And there is no exclusive funding, if you will, that is generated for the operation, maintenance and improvement of that outside of grants or, and or loans from the state and maybe federal government that sometimes are, well, quite frankly, hard to get and uh, hit or miss in terms of their long-term sustainability. So, the city of Philadelphia, Lancaster, and others are starting to look at green infrastructure initiatives that tackle a myriad of challenges. For instance, combined sewer overflows, raw sewage discharges in heavy rain events that simply over-challenge our sewer systems, our combined sewer systems where sewage and stormwater flow. Instead of tearing up streets and building bigger pipes and putting in underground detentions, capsules or basins, if you will, these storage tanks, we're planting trees and greening roofs and putting in rain gardens and rain barrels. These practices not only are cheaper by, in some cases, orders of magnitude, they achieve the same reduction. They achieve the regulatory obligations to reduce that raw sewage discharge, but at the same time, they reduce the amount of stormwater entering the system, they improve that stormwater by filtering it, therefore facilitating that biological, chemical, and physical removal of any pollutants. Remember, when we think about our urban infrastructure, there's little or no opportunity for the environment to interact in many cases with stormwater. So we're greening that and giving the environment through vegetation, various different types of practices like rain gardens, rain barrels, rain, uh, excuse me, uh, trees and green roofs, 
to interact that stormwater to be removed and interact with the environment. Um, and then also provide for a myriad of other benefits like heat island effect, carbon sequestration, the cooling of, of our urban communities, as well as a myriad of other benefits. And so what we see is that we can tackle more than two birds with one stone, regulatorily as well as uh, environmentally with these types of approaches. So the challenge economically is finding innovative methodologies to secure funding and resources that are sustainable for the upgrade operation and maintenance of new infrastructure, green infrastructure in our urban communities. It's then also facilitating in keeping what we have, this, this, the financial and technological support that we've established from the federal government on down through the state to the counties and then to the local communities and, and local farmers on the agricultural side of the equation, through the Farm Bill primarily. What we've seen with some of the recent uh, sequestration initiatives and things of that nature and the, the sunsetting of the Farm Bill recently in Congress is that these issues can be contentious. Conservation, while it shouldn't be a contentious issue, in many cases is. And so the challenge is to maintain those streams of funding that we have established, as well as the technological resources for farmers to do the work that needs to be done, to continue with the efforts and the investments that they have made, that we have made as society over the past decades, and not to turn our back and to simply divest ourselves from that effort and then lose, in many cases, the money that we have invested over the past couple of decades. We need to get the job done. And to get the job done, we need to keep the metal, the pedal to the metal, if you will. So I think that's, that's the challenges are that keeping those sources and, and thinking innovatively about how we can create new sources, to direct existing funding sources to be more effective to meet our obligations, not necessarily all our desires, but our regulatory and, and our, our cultural obligations to ourselves as well as to our future. CBF isn't only an advocacy organization. Uh, you guys get your hands dirty, too, in the field. What, what kinds of projects are you involved in right now? I saw in the Harrisburg Patriot News this week, they did a series of two articles on the efforts of the foundation to work with Amish farmers in Lancaster County. Uh, can you give us a quick overview of some of those real hands-on efforts that your staff are involved in? Yeah, that's actually a $1.6 million effort that is uh, trying to look at how we can further facilitate the adoption of streamside forests, known as forest buffers, in agricultural settings with the Amish and Old Mennonite communities in Lancaster and Chester counties. And, you know, these are folks that uh, have religious obligations or religious uh, convictions that sometimes keep them separate from engaging in certain initiatives that may be sponsored by the government, if you will. So we're looking at ways that we can help sweeten the pot with this, this community to help them adopt a myriad of practices, pollution reduction practices, that not only benefit them and their bottom line, but then also help achieve load reductions that help us meet our re local water quality obligations and our obligations to the Chesapeake Bay. We're also doing something very similar up in Bradford County as well. But we've been working with farmers since 1997 on the restoration of streamside forests, almost primarily. And we've been able to facilitate during that time roughly 2,400, over 2,400 miles of streamside forests in Pennsylvania's portion of the Bay watershed alone. Quite frankly, that's, a, that's a, an example of an initiative that quite, I, I do not know of another organization that can say that. And this is one of the most cost-effective practices that we have available to us. In the past, we've done a lot of other types of work as well, uh, facilitating the composting of excess manure in Lancaster County for the use, uh, beneficial end uses like uh, acid or abandoned mine land reclamation projects, stormwater abatement projects. In fact, compost from uh, this project was actually utilized in the rain garden that was established at 
the Farm Show Complex, a very high profile and center stage rain garden that is demonstration of how agricultural issues and residuals can be used to address and facilitate the abatement of an urban stormwater problem. We've worked with farmers on looking at precision feeding opportunities and what sorts of uh, nu nutrient reductions can be achieved from more precise application of nutrients within the feed of dairy cattle. Not only does that re remove or reduce the output in terms of the nutrients that's in their manure, but it saves the farmer money at, at the end of the day because they're not wasting money on nutrients that are not utilized by the cattle. So we have a myriad of other uh, myriad of things that we've done in the past and that's just a sampling of it. What we're looking at now is also starting to emphasize and work more intimately with the urban and suburban community as well. And so I'm hopeful that in the future we will have similar examples of success that we can tout from the urban and suburban side of the equation like rain gardens, rain barrels, retrofitting of existing in stormwater infrastructure to demonstrate how we can more beautify our communities while addressing a myriad of other environmental concerns. The uh, Susquehanna River Basin um, really covers some of the most active Marcellus Shale drilling activities in Pennsylvania. And I wanted to, to ask you just, just uh, a little bit about from a scientific standpoint, what work is going on to document uh, the impacts this is having uh, on water quality in the Susquehanna River Basin? Have there been has there been some work done on that particular issue to see if there is a is an impact and to quantify that impact? Well, there has been a myriad of research from academia looking at a whole host of different potential impacts associated with the essentially the industrialization of, of this particular part of our, our landscape. And our concern certainly is with the potential for local water quality impacts. And that's where largely uh, the research has been uh, centering on from academia as well as certain um, other governmental agencies like DCNR, the Susquehanna River Basin Commission and others that have been studying this issue and looking at trying to quantify the not only water quality impacts in terms of the chemistry as far as nutrients and, uh, and toxic chemicals and sediments from the construction of roads and, and well pads and the removal of forests, but then also um, looking at any type of hydrological impacts in terms of uh, reductions of flow and things of that nature. What we are concerned with is, is, is the cumulative impact as well. So in terms of looking at into the future as we look at the different scenarios as to what this industry may or may not look like in Pennsylvania once it really starts to get take root and it already has in many communities but when we look at the spatial extent of the Marcella shale and other shale layers it's not just the Marcella shale layer but and the infrastructure needs to get to that gas what are the cumulative impacts to our environment as a whole in terms of the air, the water quality in our streams locally, but then in the Susquehanna River and into the Chesapeake Bay. And primarily looking at what that land disturbance, which is probably the most significant, potentially anyway, near-term impact to local and regional water quality, the forest loss and the potential for the changes in stormwater flow and and, and, and amount coming from new roads as well as roads that may not be have the carrying capacity, older roads that were developed for a time that's now gone, uh, what kind of impact they're having in terms of any erosion that's occurring from the sides of those roads as well as from any new infrastructure pipelines as well as the well pads from the forest loss and the development and construction of these facilities cumulatively what has the what is that potential because quite frankly as i mentioned earlier we have this blueprint this chesapeake bay clean water blueprint and we have plans in pennsylvania as to how we can achieve those load reductions and and it's very specific to certain certain source sectors agriculture point sources uh, urban stormwater runoff and others what we haven't been 
haven't done yet is determine quantitatively, is there an impact within the basin to this industry over time? And if so, if there is a demonstrable impact, a significant impact, how do we make room for it, if you will? Because we've allocated planning goals and not, not regulatory caps, but to achieve our overall load reductions, we've kind of put source sectors with goals within each source sector and then kind of distributed those down to the county. Well, if we're not accounting for this new industrial activity, how do we make room for it in terms of our environment and our obligations to Chesapeake Bay? So ultimately, that's our question. What, if any, cumulative impact is there to the Susquehanna River and the Chesapeake Bay from the physical infrastructure and development of this resource? And if it is notable, how do we make room for it and address it so that we all are doing our fair share in terms of load reductions to the Chesapeake Bay? I think you've given us a pretty good overview of, of first starting out with the State of the Bay report and then sort of a thumbnail about where things stand right now and some of the major issues. I guess one of the things that uh, one of the questions folks often ask is, why should folks in Pennsylvania care about the Chesapeake Bay? That can be a couple hundred miles away for some people. Um, obviously, a lot of things you've been talking about in terms of uh, best management practice and practices and nutrient reductions benefit local water quality tremendously because we have local water quality problems. How would you answer that question? Why should folks care in Pennsylvania care about the Chesapeake Bay? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, it's an appropriate one. And quite frankly, the simple fact of the matter is, is that the Chesapeake Bay simply reflects back to us the cumulative health and quality of our local rivers and streams. And so while we use the bay as a touchstone, if you will, and now we have regulatory obligations for this 64,000 square mile watershed in which roughly half of Pennsylvania drains its water to, it's all really about, for Pennsylvania, the health and quality of the rivers and streams in our own backyard. Roughly a third of our streams right now in Pennsylvania don't meet water quality standards. Agriculture is the leading cause of impairment to local rivers and streams in Pennsylvania, followed by acid mine drainage, the legacy of coal mining, and urban and suburban stormwater runoff. So the things that we do to restore the Chesapeake Bay actually have their benefit, first and foremost, to the regulatory obligations and moral obligations, I, I would contend, to our local rivers and streams. So, you know, what we are talking about in terms of the health and condition of the Chesapeake Bay and these regulatory obligations, many folks may not realize that's coming to and taking root to our local streams. There is a, a regulatory component of the Clean Water Act called the TMDL, or Total Maximum Daily Load, and it's basically the scientific answer to how much pollution is too much in a stream. And or a lake or any receiving water body. Well, we have one for the Chesapeake Bay. Actually, it's 92 little TMDLs, and, but, but we have one for the Chesapeake Bay, and Pennsylvania has a role to play in that, and we have obligations for that. But all of those thousands and thousands of miles of streams in Pennsylvania that don't meet water quality standards, well, eventually they are going to have a TMDL too, unless they already have one. And so what we're talking about in terms of the Chesapeake Bay is coming to a, a, to your, to a stream in your backyard, likely. At least there's a, a pretty good chance of it. So the investments we make today in terms of clean water are going to benefit us, first and foremost, in the improvement and condition of our local rivers and streams for our regulatory and moral obligations. There are economic benefits to this as well. Reduced flooding, obviously we're sensitive. Sandy could have potentially devastated the state of Pennsylvania, but we've seen what can occur with the hurricane remnants or hurricanes that come through Pennsylvania just in the last several years and the flooding events and the loss of, of uh, human, uh, our, our property 
the erosion that occurs from these things, the practices that we talk about in our urban suburban landscape in re-greening these areas will help deal with these issues. The pollution reduction practices that we talk about on agricultural settings not only improve the environment, but they oftentimes improve the farmer's bottom line. They improve herd health in many cases for dairy farmers. They improve the amount of nutrients that are held in the soil and therefore increase crop growth rates for row crop agriculture. They save farmers money by reducing the amount of excess nutrients they apply on their land. And so it saves money as well as improving herd health, all of which combined with our urban and suburban infrastructure improvements ultimately serve our economy as well as our quality of life here in Pennsylvania. So these investments in the beautification of our communities through green infrastructure, the investments in agriculture, the investments in our infrastructure, stormwater, wastewater, prove first and foremost, that we have benefits right here in our backyard. And let us not forget that the majority of Pennsylvanians get their drinking water from surface water sources. It's treated, but the cleaner that water is before it enters into that drinking water treatment facility, the less treatment it has to undergo, and therefore more, the less money you spend on treating it, but also the less pollution that's in that water as it gets into that treatment plant, well, the, less, the more assurity you have that you are receiving clean and healthy water at the end of that pipe. So let us not forget that these have direct impacts on our economy, our quality of life, and ultimately human health as well. I really want to thank you for taking the time. I think you, uh, a lot of interesting stuff came out as a result of the report, but I think it was also important for folks to under, get, understand sort of where we are with the Chesapeake Bay restoration efforts here in Pennsylvania. So, Harry, thanks very much for taking the time today. Thank you, Dave, and it's been a pleasure, and I look forward to speaking to you folks in the future.